All right, welcome to another episode of Hail to the Podcast. I am your host, Brandon Justice, and joined by me, as always, is the Dash Man himself. How are you, my friend? Bored. We hate the bye. Hate we the hate, bye the week. Week. hate the double bye. Hate the bye week. Gonna wake up on Saturday and feel like something's missing. Hate the double bye week. What's the, I mean, look, if you're an athlete and you're playing 12 games in a row, you're 18 to 21 years old. You know, you're probably enjoying the two weeks off rather than just the one. So That's true. And when I wake up on Saturday morning, my first thought will probably be, oh, Bam LSU. Right. Yeah. So it's, from a viewing standpoint, it's a great bye week placement. It is. From a I hate to bye week standpoint, it's awful and I hate it. So uh, this would have been a great bye if it was a solo bye week. Because the first bye was weird because it was very... Three weeks into the season. Yeah, it was very early. Um, this one makes a little bit more sense before Michigan State. It's obviously a very proper placement, and it doesn't come off a really emotional win or anything. It's just just Maryland. So, mm-hmm. speaking of which, a quirky win, right? Speaking of which, Maryland. What yeah. did you think about that one? Uh, at first, I was pretty underwhelmed by the offense. Thought the defense bent but didn't break. Uh, definitely came up with some big plays in the red zone. Uh, Giles Jackson taking the opening kickoff back. That pretty much did it for the day. Yeah, um, right off the bat. But even at that. Which the sky cam, big fan. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not. You don't like the sky cam? I think I'm just so used to the traditional camera. That seeing the camera move with Giles uh, Jackson and nerd. get so close on that angle. I don't know. Maybe yeah, I'm just gotta stubborn. Evolve. You gotta evolve. You can't just I'm, dash I'm straight. Sticky. You gotta evolve. You gotta take a turn every now and then, you know? I dash everywhere. I know. That's the joke. It is. But sometimes you need to turn because you just keep dashing straight and it's just going to end bad. I suppose. Before yeah. we go any further, we should mention that there's a third person in the room today. There is. Yes. His name is Zach. Zach, say hi from a distance. Hello. It, it's, you got to speak up. Hello. Thanks. Yeah, Zach's my friend. He's just here because my car broke down and I need a ride. Anyways, mm-hmm. PR, SID. PR. Yeah, this is actually, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. This is my Dave Abeloff. Yeah. <laughs> He's just following me around everywhere I go. Oh, that's funny. Wow. Huh. It was a good joke. <laughs> it was. You get like four of those an episode. So that's your first. We'll see if you get three okay. more. I'm just consistent. I'm okay. just so thirty eight seven, that was the score. Right? It was. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I hate Maryland. It's like ever since the whole Maryland Rutgers thing happened. Look, I know that I say this a lot. I pretty much always say how I hate other teams that just annoy me. You know, it's weird because Ohio State doesn't annoy me. Um Mark D'Antonio had lately has, because of his whole media thing, that this this weird angle he's taking that it's the media's stupid and whatnot. You know, obviously that's bothersome, but, um, you know, Michigan State doesn't bother me. Michigan State of the past doesn't bother me or anything. Real football teams right. tend Good not to teams, bother you. Yeah, right. And here's what bothers me about Maryland is they're exactly like, hmm, what's a good example for this? I You know what? I'm... Inclined to see, I'm thinking about saying Boston College, but I don't want to go that far. So you know what? Here's a good one: BYU. Mm. BYU. It seems like every few years BYU finds a way in the top 25. And they're like, oh, BYU's a dangerous team, right? Mm-hmm. Maryland is, is kind of like that in the Big Ten, where they're always somehow after like week three or week four, they're somehow like this trendy good team because like they this year. exactly because they score a lot and they played good defense against. Our Lady of the Blind and Deaf. Like, it's just, congratulations. And everyone just... Howard. seventy nine zero. 0 Howard, which is home to a former Michigan coach and a few former Michigan assistants now. Um, so, bless their hearts, they got destroyed by Maryland. However, Maryland, annoying, because everyone's like, we love Maryland. Maryland's a Big Ten dark horse. And then there's intelligent people like myself. Who sit at home like, haha, just wait till week six and they're going to be two and three because they suck. Like, they're not that right. good. But let me ask you this. Week six, yes, they'll suck. But in year six, under Mike Loxley, do you think this is a legit program? They do you think it. Loxley makes it to year six? Like, I, th- I know that Maryland had a good performance defensively against Michigan, considering how good Michigan's offense was the week before against Notre Dame. But all that being said, they're not good. Like they're getting, they're getting throttled by every other team in the Big Ten offense. You know, what was their passing defense ranked? I know you wrote up on it. They gave oh up like four hundred. That is fringe top hundred. Yeah. So four hundred twenty-four yards a game going into it. Yeah. So which Michigan didn't reach, or rather, even come close, close to reaching. To it, yeah. Well, 
think one of those games where you're just trying to stay healthy, maybe. Yeah. I mean, not trying to do too much, but Michigan is always going to play conservative later in the season. They're just, At this point, it feels like they're just trying to get to the rivalry games, you know, outside. Of either they, obviously, they killed Notre Dame, but um, Michigan State and Ohio State, which are two of the final three games on the schedule, it just seems like they're trying to get there, and they're trying to get there healthy, and they're trying to get there without, you know, I just feel like style points really are never in Jim Harbaugh's back pocket, and not justifying it by any means. I think they definitely should have allowed Shea Patterson to continue his role that he's been on where he's been ascending rather than descending like he was so early on. Yep. Um, but, yeah, that's that's the question from that game is why didn't they press the gas and why did they look so sluggish, et cetera, et cetera. And, look, I mean, seven days prior to that, they're playing in a monsoon. Mud's flying everywhere. <laughs> it would, but it's turf, so there wasn't right. any mud. But you Rubber know, particles. Right. They're, they're playing in a monsoon. It's crazy outside. They're an emotional game that really was close for the majority of the first three quarters, yeah. right? And it's a dogfight for for the most part in that moment or in that part of the game. Fourth quarter, obviously, it's a boat race. They're just killing them. It's it's over, and they're enjoying it. It's you know bitter not not bittersweet, it's just sweet. You know sweet, they're enjoying yeah. it all. Uh, first three quarters, though, you're playing in a monsoon dogfight. Right, and it's emotional. It's a rivalry game. This is personal for them after what happened last year. Um, it's also personal for them because they were pretty much told they weren't going to win by almost every pundit, mm, yep. I would say. Uh, and then they just killed them. So yeah. seven days later, to try and find that same energy, to try and find that same emotion, and to just pile it onto Maryland, you know, it's not as easy. Look, you you know they're going to win that game and you put yourself in their shoes, and as much as you hear Harbaugh say, oh, well, every game's like the last game, you know, as much yeah. as those things are heard, do you really think the players are thinking that? No. Like, they're going, they, yeah. they know. They know they're going to win that game. Uh, and, of course, they're going to assert all their energy into that game, but it's not going to be as emotional. It's not going to be as personal for them as right, another game. By the same token, because it's not as emotional and not as personal, wouldn't that be even more of a reason to go for those style points and to try to try to get in the reps that you might not get? In a yeah. traditional rivalry game or something even, if you want to start looking ahead at the schedule, you're going to need these guys as talented trio of receivers, running Bell out of the slot, potentially even Sainra still. Those are guys you're going to need if you want to take down Michigan State, Ohio State, get by Indiana before news broke that their quarterback is going to miss the rest of the season. So it, the word that I've used for a lot of the season is sandbox. I think that there have been some games where Shea Patterson should have had the chance to play in a sandbox to kind of do what he wants sling it around the field, get these receivers involved, see what they can do, see what works, see, even more importantly, what doesn't work so they could rep it in practice. And I think the second, not even the second half, the last three quarters against Maryland was a really good opportunity to do that that I think they wasted. Yep. It's a good wrap-up. That's mm-hmm. a good way to put it. Call it style points, you. if you will. Call yeah. it reps, if you will. I, I think it's all based and on they perspective. Need they need it. They need it. They're not... You know, they had one good performance, one great performance, I would say, against a good team this year, but they're not polished world beaters. You know, Alabama can get by with beating Maryland 38-7, and Ohio State can get away with that too. But Michigan just, yeah, I agree with you. Should have put mm-hmm. it on more, didn't. It is what it is. So uh, with it being the bye week, we decided to switch some things up, and we're looking at the fourth quarter of the season, and we're looking at some award races and, and who is close to winning what uh, within Michigan's locker room. So these are kind of like an internal award show. Not mm-hmm. sure if Harbaugh is going to put on a whole thing for that, but we'll see. So Don't they usually? Yeah. At Chrysler? Yeah, they usually do. And they're long mm-hmm. and kind of boring. But Does the media go? Um, the, the media got the chance to go two years ago. Okay. And I believe they got the and last year. Yeah, last year they did it. No, okay. I'm sorry. So so last year was first year, I think. I think. Okay. Don't quote me on that. Um, but, yeah, that's when Chase Winovich won MVP. So, right. um, yeah, so we're going to do three candidates for each mm-hmm. of these categories. We're going to fire through them. We'll rapid fire style. Uh, MVP, Offensive Player of the Year, Defensive Player of the Year, Breakout Star of the Year, and Rookie of the Year. So let's start from bottom and work our way to the top, and mm-hmm. let's talk Rookie of the Year. Let's I think this one seems obvious. Um, if you have to pick on just one side of the ball, uh, it's for me. It, I think it's without a doubt Zach Charbonnet. I agree. Um, you know, you can you can say there are some others in the race too. Dax Hill, who's had a great year. 
you could say, is in that race. Um, but anybody else that strikes strikes your mind? Giles well, Jackson has been obviously, you know, he had a kick return. Um, um, but aside from that, I mean, it's it's Zach Charbonnet broke the record for most rushing touchdowns from a freshman ever in Michigan history mm-hmm. from a school where Mike Hart went and had an incredible freshman year. Yeah, and he's piling it on. Nine touchdowns I mean, as a as a freshman. Charbonnet scored his tenth in College Park. Right, with three games left in the schedule, yeah. he's got eleven. So yeah, so it's. It's Charbonnet. I mean, I, I'm with you there. Yeah. Uh, just for for qualification with rookie of the year, is that your first year of eligibility or your first year with the program? Uh, so what? For example, yeah, well, with Jalen Mayfield. Jalen Mayfield. Eligible? Well, the first year on the field. You mean? Mm-hmm. I was, I was thinking true freshman, but mm-hmm. you, we can qualify a redshirt freshman too. In which, if you're saying Hassan, first year with the program, Hassan you could even bring up Michael Dana too, who's been you could. Out, so that's a good point. Um, He's been great yeah, in the NASCAR package. You know, you can qualify. Redshirt freshman in there too. Okay. I think even even that with that still, still hands down. Yeah. yeah. So let's move on to breakout star of the year. Um, now the qualifications for a breakout star has to be a guy who he had snaps last year, but he wasn't in an, an every down starter. And for me, another one that feels kind of easy for me. Uh, if you want to put this on offense and defense, that's fine. Defensively, I think it's without a doubt Aiden Hutchinson. I mm-hmm. just think he's been. Such a force, yeah, and he is in on every single play, it seems. Yes, and I just forced a ton of fumbles, gets to the quarterback seemingly with ease, right? And what I'll say is that it's not hands down because I also think that Cam McGrown has been fantastic, right? I right. took him two or three games to see the, see the field. Uh, Josh Ross sustained his concussion against Army, correct? And then McGrown played yes. the second half against Army, um. Anyways, Cam McGrone's speed has just been elite. He gets from sideline to sideline so quickly that I just think that this, this future is bright with breakout stars on defense. Uh, I think another guy that you'll see a lot more of is Ambry Thomas as a, a primary corner going forward in the next year or two. Uh, I think that guys like Brad Hawkins really impressed back there. Obviously, Dax Hill we touched on in the rookie of the year discussion. Uh, what about on the offensive side of the ball? Because my, I think mine's pretty easy offensively. For breakout star? For breakout star. That's a great question. Why don't you start? Uh, I think Hassan Haskins has, you know what? particularly in the last month, yeah, it's gotta been be, phenomenal. Gotta be I, I think too. Mayfield also run game is, in general, you could yeah. point that out because right. Higdon was good. You know, Higdon was good. But this is a force. You know, these mm-hmm. guys are running all over everybody. Right. Jonathan Taylor was shut down by Illinois, you know, for the most part. I shouldn't say shut down, but he was pretty much – Kept at bay. He was Illinois. not kept at bay against Michigan. He was not. <laughs> they spent more time looking at the back of his jersey than the front. Haskins and Charbonnet ran all over Illinois. <laughs> so I don't. I hate transitive property for the most part, but that seems like a good time to use it when Jonathan yeah. Taylor has some trouble slotting. But Hassan Haskins and Charbonnet do whatever they want, especially Haskins, who had one incredible run in the first quarter, too. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, we'll go with that. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm going to go with. On the offensive side of the ball, I'm going to agree with you with Haskins, and mm-hmm. I'm going with Hutchinson on the other side. But I feel right. like Dax Hill is a, is a good one as a breakout. Um, I don't think he's done enough to, to qualify for it, but McGrone is definitely a great 1A or 1B. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think the difference is Hutchinson had so much production in the three games that McGrone didn't mm-hmm. that that's why I would pick him over him. Um, another one, though, that we're, that you could easily throw in there is Ambry Thomas. Yeah. Henry yeah. Thomas is a guy that is probably right there with Aiden Hutchinson, mm-hmm. I would say. Mm-hmm. And McGrone probably trails behind them, I would say, yeah. um, for and my opinion. Offensively, but, a name that I'll throw in there is Ronnie Bell. Yep. guy who won Rookie of the Year last year on offense and took a massive step forward this year. Uh, he'll probably be remembered for one low moment, but mm-hmm. all in all, he's leading Michigan in receptions and yardage, I believe. And right. If not, is towards the top in both categories, and quite frankly, seems like Shea's guy. At least early on in the year, he was. Right. So, being that safety blanket and being effective and really catching the ball, I, I think he's made the full transition from hoops to football. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, now it's time for defensive player of the year. Kick it off. Defensive player of the year. I would it be very reckless of me to pick my breakout of the year as my defensive player of the year? As in, as in Aiden Hutchinson. I was thinking that too. Because I think he, he's I just, think we're on the same page here. He has he's been dominating. Yeah, he's been phenomenal. He's I, been I don't phenomenal. think I don't think he's had a bad game this no, year. He hasn't. He hasn't Another guy, if if you saw the field more, 
that you can make an argument for is Josh Uche because he seems like he's yeah, Josh Uche a is massive been, difference maker. Yeah, and you know what? He could probably qualify for breakout, to be honest, too. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think he I broke think out last, last year. year was yeah. his breakout year. Yeah. This year, people came in expecting, probably unreasonably, expecting the amount of pressure he generated last year. Yeah, so I would say Defensive Player of the Year, if we're picking, we, we said we were going to pick three candidates, and it seemed like the first three awards we were giving out were all kind of unanimous. Mm-hmm. Um, but this one, you could you could spread around. Josh Uche. Levert Hill. Levert Hill. Aiden Hutchinson. Um, I mean, I know that he has, he. the difference here is this guy has had a bad game, but Josh Metellus has yeah. been really good, especially oh, yeah. in run support, and he's been making some plays and turnovers as well. Yeah. Um, um, somehow, Jordan Glasgow uh, yeah. qualified for the top Buckus 15 award. linebacker award. Hey, uh, his numbers are great. <laughs> his numbers are great, really, they are. Yeah. But his film, it's just his coverage. So if you're, if you're giving an award for best linebacker, I guess pass coverage is something that doesn't really get as looked at as the other numbers like sacks and pressures and, and all of that, and that's where Glasgow stars. So... Um, so, yeah, I'll go with those three for Defensive Player of the Year for now. Hutchinson, Quiddy Pay's had a year, but he did get hurt. But Quiddy Pay is probably somewhere in the three to four range. I would say probably fourth. I'm with you. Um, but he can make a difference here in these final three games and really push his way in. So, mm-hmm. Offensive Player of the Year. This could go a million ways. However, I think if you had to say who is the best player on this team offensively, that was, that's where it gets kind of obvious for me. And it's Nico Collins. I agree with you. I, I, I mean, think pound for pound in the sense of usage in this right. case. Uh, Orion Sang of the Detroit Free Press tweeted out some stats about Collins the other day. Just a phenomenal year in general. He's a force. Still He's going to be a day one, one day career. two guy. Right, yeah, and that was, what, against Middle Tennessee State this yep. year? Yep. Right? Well, he did have a drop against Wisconsin. I don't know okay. if I'd qualify as a drop, though. But either way... To have two, the amount you're target. I mean, hey, he still needs to get targeted more. Like, we haven't solved that. Mm-hmm. I mean, not even against Notre Dame did we solve the whole target him more because he was open more mm-hmm. than he was <laughs> thrown to. Yeah. Uh, but it's a monsoon, so you can't blame him. Mm-hmm. Um, regardless, we haven't solved that. Wasn't thrown at enough against Maryland either, a team that's, that would give up 500 yards to New York Collins if they really target him as much as they yeah. wanted to. <laughs> he's just incredibly efficient, incredibly consistent. He catches everything, and if he's not catching it, it's getting knocked away, and there's a flag in for defense pass interference. Unless you're in Happy yeah. Valley, then it's offensive pass interference. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, on, on the year, he does have 22 catches over 400 yards. It's averaging about 20 yards per catch, added three touchdowns, six accepted pass interference calls that yep. he's drawn. Yep. Yep. He's it's just otherworldly. He is cheat code. He is, if for all my Madden 20 years out there, he is Superstar X Factor. Superstar X Factor. So. Unanimous, or you want to add in two more? I mean, Zach Charbonnet could be added. I, I think Charbonnet is in the discussion. I think Shea is in the discussion. You think I, so? I do think so. Yeah, you know, I if he continues this, I think late. I think he's I think he's outside looking in for it. But if he he's continues on an upward this, trend, exactly. Yep, yep. He I is think with a big Sunday. game against Michigan State, say he say he shows if, up for the rivalry if between games. Michigan State and Ohio State, he throws for five hundred yards, five touchdowns. Yeah. And doesn't turn the ball over multiple times. Mm-hmm. I think he leaps into the conversation for this award, especially if they win. And Dare s- I say both? Mm-hmm. No, because I think they're going to get blown out by Ohio State at this point. I don't at know this if point, they'll get blown out at home, but I do think they're going to lose at this point. I think they'll point. get blown out at home at this point. Well, we'll get there in two weeks. In All three right. weeks, whenever that comes. Sure. So, so we'll go with that. Those are our three. Mm-hmm. Um, weird to not have. Donovan Peoples Jones in that conversation, it's, he shouldn't be. He just really has yeah. in um, great catch against Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. Obviously, probably Shea Patterson's best pass in his tenure at Michigan, in my oh, opinion, yeah. since his, his Michigan career. Um, but all that being said, I mean the expectations that DPJ's had, although albeit you know kind of taken back by injury. Regardless, you'd expect him to to make a bigger difference and you know maybe that's not on him maybe it's on what the scheme has given him but mm-hmm. regardless real quick before we move on to mvp can i add one more name yep. offensive player i think caesar ruiz should be in the conversation but he's been he's been so bad for five games that's true so but bad he, for five the, games. the games that he's played well in, he's made he's such dominated. a difference yeah but against he's, notre dame he it's made. weird because in the games he's played good in, he's been phenomenal and right. powerful and other games, in the games he's been playing so bad in so mm. what do you I think mean, of the left side with brett is it and runyon 
Can either of them belong in the conversation? Um, I think Bredesen could definitely because when they're pin and pulling with Bredesen, it's it's obvious that he is the anchor for a lot of big runs for Haskins. Like when mm-hmm. Haskins breaks off those big runs in, in between the in between um, the tackles, you know, it's a lot of pin and pull, and it's Bredesen pulling mm-hmm. or it's Ruiz pulling, and Ruiz is so damn athletic that it really helps yeah. out. So, and yeah. I think that's what he's benefiting from is this new pin and pull stuff they're doing, which isn't new. They brought yeah, it back from new. last year. Right. Um, but they weren't doing it early on. They were doing mo- mostly zone, and they would mix in some some gaps, but that was pretty much it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he's benefiting a lot from what they're doing now. So MVP is the big one. We'll just, we're will just we just going to go team MVP. Not offensive, not defensive, MVP. Definition of MVP, most valuable player. Mm-hmm. You know, who do they need most? Who would they – Feel the impact of them not being there most. I just wish they used him more so that we could have some more numbers to back this up. But from a gut feeling, the eye test, as it's referred to, looking at the field, I think one guy stands out. I think one guy stands out more than the rest. There are probably three or four guys who really stand out. Yeah. But mm-hmm. I think without Nico Collins... Without Nico Collins, there's, there is... A passing game that's probably even less efficient than it's been in, yes. in, in bad times. You know, he is the guy who shows up in the games where they have to have something. Like, for instance, that Penn State throw. Yeah. I mean, he catches that and the correct call is made, right? That's massive. Flips the whole game. Yeah. And it should have flipped the whole game because he yeah. did catch it. Mm-hmm. And if that catch is ruled as it should have been or just now no flag at all, mm-hmm. it's a totally different ball game completely. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, he flips the uh, game on its head with those deep balls. He really yeah. does. I guess he has multiple fifty-plus yard receptions. The six drawn pass interference calls is ridiculous, yeah. given that he only has twenty-two catches. You got to figure that he just needs the ball in his hands right. these last three games. And the third down pass, the fade to him against oh, Notre Dame filthy. to to really pretty much put the filthy. dagger that in the coffin. Sixteen-yard touchdown, tiptoeing in the back of the end mm-hmm. zone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A pro. The future pro, I'm really making a case to go this year and be a top two-round, three-round guy. Yeah, CBS Sports had him as a 22nd overall pick to the Raiders in their last the mock Raiders. draft. Raiders. Could you imagine him in Oakland? Vegas. He's a, that's a bad man if he goes to <laughs> Oakland. Him and Derek Carr. Forget <laughs> Antonio Brown, right? Yeah. So uh, let's hail to the spread. Let's do it. No eyes on the enemy this week because the enemy is on our couch because it's bye week. Yeah. I'm thinking of convincing somebody because i don't want to do it myself because i know i'll mess it up some real phenomenal food for saturday maybe i'll order in oh, i don't food. know i don't know maybe order in perhaps we'll see but i'm thinking like some dip some real killer dip okay what's on your mind <sighs> mm-hmm. like buffalo chicken is so easy to be the one to choose so i really want to switch it up like i want something cheesy A cheese maybe platter. some beef in there like some okay. cheese and some beef and just some sort, some tortilla about, chips, uh, maybe pita chips. What if you know. do a uh, ravioli with meat sauce? That is not dip. Oh, you're, you're talking dip. I thought just you were strictly just strictly dip. Food but snacks. I'm down for ravioli. I was gonna I say, mean, you if get you want to throw ravioli. ravioli in there with my dip, like, and we'll call it a whole platter, I'm down. I'm cool with that. However, we have some spreads to hail to, so let's do that. Alabama LSU, biggest game of the week, biggest game probably of the year in college football this mm-hmm. year. Uh, thought it was going to be number Until one. Until January. Number, right. Thought it was going to be number one, number two. College football playoff rankings come out. It's not number one versus number two. Just stealing our freaking joy. Um, Ohio State at one is justified, but at the same time it's like, mm, is it? I don't know. I, I tweeted out that I thought it was um, because in the moment I'm like, yeah, you know, they're, they're definitely deserving of number one. Yes. But here's the thing. So is Alabama and so is LSU, and you know what? That's – that's just how it is. There's never going to be – there's sometimes – there's some instances where number one is unanimous, but that doesn't happen too often. So mm-hmm. um, that's what makes it fun. That's why college football is fun. Bama's favored right. by six and a half points. Um, they have an, an, an insane receiving core. Henry Ruggs, Devontae Smith, Jerry Judy, who is unbelievable. Judy's going to be a top ten pick in the draft. Correct. Tua is back. Um, Enormous. Najee Harris is amazing. Uh, the offensive line, Malls, Alex Leatherwood, Jedrick Wills, all guys who are just almost Wolverines and incredible. Yeah. Um, Najee was a, a, a day away from enrolling at Michigan. Correct. There's a, a writer at the Michigan Daily who's a senior now who said that she saw him on his flight to Detroit 
for her orientation, and then two days later he enrolled at Alabama. Yep, yep, that's how it went. So, anyways, six and a half, Bama. LSU, Joey Burrow is incredible. Uh, John Emery is is ascending. Uh, Defensively, they are strong. I don't know if they're as good as Alabama defensively. Uh, They are DBU, so so they will challenge that, that Alabama passing attack. But let's, I mean, here's the thing. This is going to be high scoring because both teams are going to go balls out, verts. They're going to, the whole nine. I think Bama has the same strategy offensively they did against Clemson in the national championship where they just air it out, air it out, air it out. Um, And I think LSU does the same thing that they did with Texas where Mm -hmm. they air it out, air it out, air it out. So six and a half is the line. I would like the over in this game. Um, But at six and a half being the line, it's tough. This feels like a 38 34, maybe a 42 38, maybe a 31 28 type game, somewhere in between there. Um, so I'll take LSU's points at six and a half. Uh, I'll probably be wrong. Bam will probably do some something crazy because LSU has had way more. They've been way more battle tested than Alabama. They've had way tougher games. They've played Alabama. They've played Florida. They've, or I'm sorry, they've played Texas. Auburn. My bad. They've played Auburn. Texas they've played A&M. Florida. They've played Texas A&M. They've played Texas. Um, or no, they played Texas, not Texas A&M. Right. Alabama's played Texas A&M. Um, but they've just had a lot of tough games to yeah. play that they've come out on top on, but you know, eventually you, you get a little tired. Both teams are off a bye. Um, another factor in there. So yeah. regardless, I'm taking LSU's points here. I'm going to go with Alabama, minus 6.5. I, I don't blame you at all. I think they win this game by a touchdown. I think just generally from a standpoint of talent, they are right. more than a touchdown, better than LSU. It's at home. I think... Yes, this game being in Tuscaloosa is absolutely massive. I think a Nick Saban coached team is not going to come out and be surprised mm-hmm. by anything. All right, Iowa, Wisconsin. Badgers are favored by eight and a half. Um, they're a little bit cold right now, a little bit rusty, coming mm-hmm. off back-to-back losses suddenly, losing mm-hmm. to Illinois in a very shocking loss, uh, and then losing to Ohio, Ohio State. State and getting blitzed by Ohio State. Yeah. Um, but they still have that remarkable blowout of Michigan that's keeping them in the race for uh, the Big Ten West, and just the college football playoff still ranks them uh, more high than some think they should be. Uh, regardless, Hawkeyes, a team that's always going to be boring and dry, uh, but they're always going to play tough and disciplined, and this game screams under. It absolutely is screaming, screaming, screaming under. It is pulling my hair and <laughs> yelling at me to take the under. Um, but we've got the points listed here. Wisconsin's favored by eight and a half. Earlier in the year when they went to South Florida, they were on the road at South Florida. Twelve and a half was the line. We thought it was inflated because South Florida, who was terrible now, yeah. we thought would be good. We um, did. And we elected to, I think I took Wisconsin, but you elected to take the points, which I thought would end up happening, but I just had this weird feeling that they were going to win by like 14. Mm-hmm. end up winning 49 nothing. Yeah. So I'm not going to make that mistake again. So I'm going to take the points here with Wisconsin. I just think that with Jonathan Taylor, um, they'll win by 10. I am too. I was very underwhelmed by Iowa's trip to the big house. Yes, it was. And it was pretty boring. Yeah, no, ten, abs- seven, absolutely. Ten three, ten, ten three, three, ten three, awful. Ten three. Uh, Nate Stanley just looked lost against the real defense, and I think Wisconsin has a real defense. Correct. Uh, there's a lot to like about Wisconsin's offense, particularly an offensive line of superstars. Jonathan Taylor, the best ball carrier in the nation, arguably. Uh, I think this game being in Madison is absolutely massive. You saw the impact that the student section had on the Michigan game, and I, I've just I've got a feeling that Wisconsin wins this game by double digits. All right, last game is Penn State Minnesota. The line we have here is the total. It's at forty seven and a half. Both teams are undefeated. Minnesota convinced everybody to bring game day to this game. That didn't happen, <laughs> and here we are. Both teams are undefeated. What, yeah. a, what a world. Wow. Yeah. The bigger Golden Gophers are good. Um, like everybody else, I think Minnesota's a fraud. I think they'll lose two games, <laughs> maybe three games at this point. Um, probably just two, though. And I like Penn State this year just because their defense is so good. So, yeah. 47 and a half. This, I, you know what, Minnesota's defense also good, which is why the line's so low at 47 and a half. Um, but I don't think they face an offense like Penn State. I don't think they've seen... Um, they've seen like Penn State light, like Penn State Junior, which is Maryland, yeah. and they shut them down and offensively. Maryland, Maryland lost to Penn State 59 zip. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's going to be rough. Um, this game screams Penn State by like 
17. Um, just because Penn State's only favored by seven. Yeah, well, I would hammer that. I would get the whole toolkit out and throw <laughs> yeah. out the garage and just hammer every single <laughs> yeah. nail in the freaking place. So, um, but the over unders will be have down. So, ah, uh, this one is weird because I feel like Penn State's going to score a lot of points, probably like 31. Right. And I'm thinking like 31 7 final. So I'll take the under. Yeah, I, I will too. I, I think Minnesota does nothing in this game. Uh, but offensively, I think. Penn State, Sean Clifford, KJ Hamler. I think this is a, an offense that could put up 40. I, I just don't think that Minnesota has the athleticism to guard against and, quite frankly, lock down anything that Penn State's going to mm. throw at them if the game plan even reminisces right, what right. they did against Michigan. They can take shots like that. Yeah, if Josh Metellus and, yeah, I mean, Josh Uche for a little bit there, but if, if these guys couldn't keep up with KJ Hamler and Pat Fryer with in coverage I, I don't think Minnesota does uh, the game being in Minnesota is very helpful yeah I think I was thinking uh, about that too the Penn weather State, could play a factor right Penn State being on the road away from home after such a, a comforting atmosphere is gonna be so cold. maybe a, a storyline yeah but I just think that the better football team is gonna win by a whole lot more than seven points but I don't think think about a large Minnesota's Minnesota good. man frozen in the cutoff in that game he probably loves nipples it. just poking through his shirt oh. cutting glass oh minnesota minnesota's a weird place it's never like been heaven on earth never been don't really want to go people are gonna be like oh my god it's amazing no it's not it's probably <laughs> not fun at all so that's why never I, been never gone but i'm gonna make a definitive statement about it sucking you should know who i am at this point right <laughs> all right well that's the show quick easy good bye week show yeah. Send me recommendations for what dip I should make on Saturday and or recommend somebody else to make because I know that I'll mess it up. Mm-hmm. And make sure you point out the fact that Brandon's Lions took a very big it. loss last weekend, but Daniel's Dolphins took an even bigger loss by beating the Jets. Yeah. Addition, subtraction by addition? Would that be the term for yeah. winning and when you don't want yeah, to? It would be. I, I, I get that the players wanted to beat Gase, but... As a front office, you, gotta, you just hate to you see it. Shut that you down. just hate to Gosh. see it. You just hate to see. It. They'll still get the number one pick unless the Bengals can. Well, I was going to say the Bengals are Bengals so. would take a quarterback. At least with the number they one didn't pick depend on team. Logan freaking Thomas at the goal <laughs> line. All right, some of us have it worse than others. It's okay? like you have Kenny Galladay. At least your Logan team doesn't Jones think it's going to compete, and then on the last play of the game, they throw out Logan Thomas and take off Kenny Galladay and Marvin Jones, who are number one and number two respectively in touchdown catches on the season. But I digress. Thank you for tuning into Hail to the Podcast. That's Daniel Dash. I'm Brandon Justice. And remember, if you hail to the victors, you better hail to the podcast.